In this tutorial, we're going to look at digital audio clocking. What is all this business about internal clock, external clock, word clock? And why does my audio device or interface have this control panel that makes me choose between the different digital sync sources? Well, let's find out. A key to understanding all of these digital clocks is understanding digital recording itself. In digital recording, we're taking snapshots of our audio at a very periodic rate. We're just taking snapshot after snapshot. Those snapshots are called samples, and the rate at which they're taken is the sample rate. For example, an audio CD has a sample rate of 44,100 samples per second. That's a lot of samples. Those samples are recorded and put on the hard disk somewhere. They aren't time-stamped. There's no real way for the computer to know which one to play when. It just saves them in sequential order, sample number one, sample number two, sample number three, etc. And then when you ask to play them back, it just starts playing them back in numerical order. Hopefully with the same sample rate as you recorded so that everything will play back the same as you recorded it. And since the computer knew the original sample rate, it's no big deal. It can just play back at the same rate. Everything is good. However, if we're going to sync a bunch of digital devices together, we're going to need some kind of common clock signal so that everybody can play back at the same rate. That clock signal is right here, digital clock. It looks like a square wave. Every time that wave rises up, it triggers another sample. You can see at every rise, there's a sample played. Why do we need to know about this? Well, things get more complicated when we have multiple digital devices connected together. In our previous example, we've got our audio interface happily playing away, and it's clocked by its own internal digital clock. What if we add a CD player with a digital output to our mix here? We've got a CD player playing back, and you can look at the right edge of this thing. The CD player's clock is ever so slightly slower than the interface's clock. So the CD player's last sample is kind of hanging off the edge there. It didn't arrive at the same moment in time as the interface's last sample. We have a problem if we try to mix them together. If we feed both those signals into a digital mixer, the digital mixer will say, all right, I've got the interface's sample. Where's the one from the CD player? It's not here yet. It's not here yet. I don't know what to do. Uh, I think I'll spit out some clicks, pops, and bad sound. <laughs> That's what happens when you... We know when the digital mixer can't deal with a sample that's missing or a repeated sample because the clocks are not synchronized. So what we need to do is get rid of that clock that's in the in our interface and replace it with the clock from the CD player. We'll take the clock from the CD player and somehow feed that into our interface and sort of reclock or play back our samples at the exact same clock rate as our CD player. We'll just use the CD player's clock to play back our samples, which will make them perfectly aligned in time, and then when the mixer goes to mix those two together, we've got good sound. To do that clock substitution thing, we need to select the clock from the CD player in our interface's control panel. So we'll click in the control panel and get that list of things, and we'll select the SPDIF coaxial input, which is the kind of cable that we've got plugged from our CD player into that input on this particular digital interface. Everybody's good? We're clocked together. Now there's one more option on this list that doesn't make sense. Optical port, that makes sense. There's optical digital, there's ADAT optical, you know, those things make sense. But what's word clock? Well, to understand word clock, we've got to look at what's in our, our digital signals. Inside that SPDIF coaxial cable, we have data and we have the clock signal. They're both mixed together inside that RCA jack. And similarly, in the optical SPDIF, we have the same thing, our left and right data and then the clock signal all in one cable. Even ADAT optical works the same way. We've got eight channels of data, one clock signal, all in one cable. A word clock is just the clock signal without any data. It's the clock by itself. When would you need to hook that up? Well, if you get a complicated setup, you might have trouble making just one device, the master, and a bunch of other devices slave to that master clock. Here's an example. 
let's look at a big PA system, like a big church that has a bunch of video and audio equipment. They've got a digital mixer with lots of digital inputs on it and some mic preamps on the stage. Here's an eight channel mic preamp that converts eight channels of analog mic to one eight channel digital signal. No problem, right? We can take that digital signal and in the control panel in our digital mixer, we'll set the clock source to digital input one. No problem there. But what if we've got a bunch more of those? We've got 32 channels of mic preamp coming in from the stage. And each one of those have wild internal clocks. We need some way to synchronize those guys so that they can all be on the same clock, yet they don't have digital inputs to synchronize to. They've just got analog in, digital out. Well, fortunately, a solution has been found with a lot of professional devices. They'll have a jack on them labeled word clock. And you can connect the word clock from one device to the next and have each one of them spit out their digital data at the exact same moment. Even though they're not connected, their signals are not connected, but their clocks are connected. If we look at the back panel of those particular A to D converters, you'll see there's a jack labeled word clock out. And we'll connect from the first ones out to the next devices in and from, you know, device number two to device number three, etc. Daisy chain those clocks. That will work, but when we get a really complicated setup, it gets a little bit hairier. Like we have a couple of CD recorders that both record and play, and we've got a video mixer that also has audio and might have some embedded digital audio in the video signal. Same thing with a professional DVD recorder, a computer interface for video that has audio and digital embedded video again. All that stuff has a clock, and we've got to figure out who's the master clock. Also, with PA systems, you often have a digital processor that turns the output of the mixer. In this case, there's a 32-channel digital connection called CobraNet from the board to a processor in that amplifier rack, and then all the monitor speakers and main speakers are connected to that rack. And it's a cool thing to have, you know, 32 channels over one Cat5, but you got to pay attention to the clocking. All these guys have to march along together so we don't have clicks and pops and bad sound. We might even have a recording interface connected to add further complexity to this whole thing. Well, this is where we need to know a little bit more about word clock to figure out how to hook all that stuff up. If we keep that first A to D converter being our master clock, it's going to put out a clock that looks like this. But after we've gone 200 feet from the stage to the sound booth and then all over the place to the video room and wherever else, we start to shape that signal. That signal is no longer pristine. Um, each time it goes through some electronics, it, the rise time of electronics just can't be infinitely fast, and you start to get these sloped-looking edges. Well, sloped edges, when you're trying to do exact timing, mean non-exact timing, right? Depending on where each device picks its trigger point on that rising slope, we might get slightly different timing. And also how far what they are from the original, you know, they might have more slope on later devices, so those guys are going to be a little bit out of step with the first device in the chain. Or if we pick up noise along the way, we're even in bigger trouble because now we have completely variable wiggle to our supposedly exact clock signal. Our digital samples are not going to be in sync. They're going to be causing trouble. That trouble, when it looks like this, is called jitter. That's the tendency for those samples to be just slightly out of a uniform, perfect sample rate, and that just makes for a bad sound. Well, what's the solution? Instead of daisy chaining everything, we could get something called a master digital clock. This picture shows a device called the Apogee Big Ben. And that thing is just a clock that you set your master sample rate for your whole setup on the front panel of that thing. And then the back panel of that thing is covered with a bunch of outputs, word clock outputs, and other digital format outputs that you can plug into the digital inputs on everything and sync those guys all up. There are a few devices that you can't do that for. They don't have a word clock in or a secondary digital input of some kind, but anything that does, you can hook up to this thing. Solves a lot of problems. In this particular setup, um, I was part of it, and I actually went with something else called a Rosendahl NanoSynx, which is just like the Apogee Big, Big Ben, except it also generates video black burst and sync signals, which are needed when you're trying to sync a bunch of video stuff that's not even in this picture. That way, everybody's marching along at a nice, stable clock, and it sounds good. Now, this example's 
more complicated than any one of you is likely to run into, but the principle is the same. You need to have your clock synchronized between your source device and your receiving device, and if you have multiple devices, you really have to pay attention to only having one master and having everyone else sync to that clock so that you can have good sound.